All right, so as we've been going through the feast cycle this year, we've had this theme of return to the garden. And I've gone through it this last week, um, what that means and how we've experienced it through this past year. But uh, as is always a good idea, because not everybody here is here for every teaching, it's always a good idea to recap the story. Where are we, what foundation have we built up to this point so we can then launch forward into what, we, what still needs to be covered? And as we examine the story of the Bible, we find that in Genesis 1, we are given the setting of the story. The setting of the story of the Bible is creation. It is the earth. And in that foundation of the setting, it is steeped in language of being God's temple, the place where he dwells with man, the place where he is honored, and his holy space. The story has characters. There's three primary characters in the Bible. There is God, there's humans, and there's the adversary. And these forces are all operating together in the story of the Bible. And as every good story does, there's also conflict in the story. And as we saw in Genesis 3, the conflict began with mankind taking for himself uh, things that were not to be his. We found mankind taking the, the three areas of creation and perverting them all, uh, which we're going to look at in just a second. And then finally, we see a resolution to the story. As every good story does, by the end, by the closing pages, the story is brought to a resolution, the conflict is resolved, and all things are set right. In most good stories. Well, as we get closer in, we drill in a little bit closer, there's the setting. And when we get to looking at the setting of the Bible, we find that it is done in three different ways. There's the source. What is the source of all things? The rest of the world has answers for what the source is. It's a Big Bang, it's evolution, it's, it's, uh, it's Horus, it's whatever, Ptah, it's all these various gods are doing their things. Well, in the Bible, the source is God, Adonai, yod heh In the beginning, it was God who created the heavens and the earth. And in the Genesis 1, as everything is being put together, as each individual step goes along, each thing is given a function. What are they supposed to do? For example, he separated light and dark, and they function as day and night. He separated the waters above from the waters below, and they function as heavens and seas, and so on and so forth. Well, when we get to mankind in Genesis 1.28, we find the function of mankind being spelled out. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. In essence, man's function was to be kings on the earth. We were to rule over it as sovereigns, to subdue it and have dominion over it. And then finally, we were given purpose. As we examined creation, we saw the three nested circles that all have to do with proximity to God or holiness. But we also saw that it was done in a series of seven, which speaks to worship. And creation itself was founded as a temple. And into that temple, God put man, and he gave man a charge. Uh, Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And as we've talked about those words, work, eved, keep, shamar, those are words that are only ever found in connection to each other in relationship to the Levites and their role in the tabernacle. Man's purpose was to be priests. So when we read throughout the Bible that God's going to make us kings and priests, that he's making us a kingdom of priests and so on and so forth, what is, what is being said is, I am going to restore to mankind your function and your purpose. Because when it comes to the conflict of the Bible, as we read of it in Genesis 3, we find that the source was perverted. Genesis 3, 5, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God's knowing good and evil. No longer is the source for morality God. We made ourselves the source for good and evil. We made ourselves the source of those items in the world. 
And not only do we now know them and can decide them, but we also experience them. But in doing so, we, in essence, attempted to replace God in his place and become gods on our own. Our function was overthrown. No longer were we ruling over all that moves on the earth. Instead, the serpent ruled over us. Genesis 3, 12 through 13. And man said, the woman whom you gave me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. They submitted to the serpent. Adam submitted to his wife, knowing she was wrong. And in doing so, that function of ruling over the earth, subduing it and bringing uh, order to the earth was overdone, was overthrown. And the purpose that we were given, Genesis 3.22, Then the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now let us, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life, eat it, and live forever. We were to be priests. We were to serve in his kingdom forever, in his temple. But because of the curse, now our purpose <coughs> has been perverted. We looked at it yesterday. The curse that was given to mankind was a curse that made living difficult. Now every moment was supposed to was spent trying to live. And when life was brought forth, it was brought forth in pain and agony and potential death because of the curse. We gave up our role as priests. And because of it, we became like the animals. And yet... Despite all of this, despite mankind corrupting everything that God had created for them, the purpose, the function, the source, we, we perverted it all. And despite that, God is bringing about a resolution. And as we uh, talked about in the first lesson, this resolution uh, is seen through the covenants that God has created through history. Every time that the story of the Bible leaps forward in some significant way, it's accompanied by a covenant that God cuts with mankind. And as we go through the covenants, we recognize that the feasts as well mimic the covenants. The feasts are a representation of the covenants that God has made. And this graphic does a great job of demonstrating that. Where you have Sabbath and Noah being to preserve mankind and Passover and Abraham, uh, the Abrahamic covenant and blessing of all nations. Shavuot, Moses, the preserving of Israel and the sanctification of Israel, and so on and so forth. And at each level, there is a new covenant that is created. It doesn't do away with the old. It builds upon the old. And it's all going towards the world to come. And as we've been here at Sukkot, that is what we're celebrating. That's what we're experiencing is a, a very real foreshadowing of the kingdom that God has in store for us. That kingdom that is the conflict restored. The re resolved, the conflict fixed, and Sukkot is the celebration of that that uh, resolution of the conflict of history. So, as we went through in, in teaching two, we looked at several covenants in order. We looked at the covenant of Noah. Uh, Noah's covenant, or the covenant that was made with Noah, wasn't just made with Noah. The covenant with Noah was made with all of creation. That God would no longer flood the earth and destroy all living things in it. We looked at the covenant with Abraham, that God would choose this one man, that he would, uh, that if Abraham would go to the land that God showed him, he would make him a great nation, and he would bless the world through this one man, and he would bless this one man with the land that he was standing on. The Sinai covenant, God takes the people out of Egypt and brings them to his holy mountain and creates a covenant of marriage with them there, bringing them into his uh, into his inner circle, drawing them close. Rather than being in that outer circle that we looked at, they're being drawn closer in towards the inner circle. And then as we looked at yesterday, there seems to be some sort of covenant with creation. Hosea 2.6 says that Adam broke the covenant. Well, what covenant is that? We don't read of it. Uh, Isaiah says that there is a, or no, sorry, Jeremiah says that there is a covenant with day and with night. Uh, it, Exodus 31 says that Sabbath is for you a perpetual covenant. The Sabbath itself seems to be a covenant that's built into creation itself that's 
the foundation of the operation of time, the cycles of time. The way that time works in our world appears to be one of God's covenants with creation, a covenant that cannot be overturned, that cannot be bypassed in any way. And Sabbath is part of that. It is a covenant that we are invited to enter into as God's creation. And when we come into Sabbath as part of God's creation, we begin to experience that resolution of the conflict because we are recognizing the source. We are recognizing we don't have to be slaves and work all the time. Instead, we can be kings and and enjoy the product of our labor. And we can be priests as we come together and we minister to each other and we minister to the world. Engaging in Sabbath is a snapshot of that future resolution. And while every other covenant seems to be uh, seems to be set at its very specific moments in time that keep coming up, Sabbath is that foundation that underlies them all. And we see that easily in Leviticus 23 as every every festival is connected to seven in some way. It's connected to a Sabbath. Well, the Sabbath <coughs> itself being a covenant is that underlying foundation that's part of creation that God is building upon as part of his restoration of the world. And as we encounter each new covenant, the story of the Bible moves into a new phase. They all build upon each other. They all include some sub-covenants, such as uh, within the Sinai covenant, there is a covenant that was made with the Levites. And there's a covenant that's made with Phineas then that's a sub-covenant of the Levites. Uh, there's the... Um, there are others, but they're slipping my mind at the moment. And nearly all of the covenants that God makes are unilateral covenants. And when we talk about how covenants work, covenants are an agreement between two parties that each party will do a certain thing. And that if they both keep their side of the covenant, the covenant stands, and their agreement stands, and their relationship stands. But for the majority of the covenants that God cuts with the world or with creation or with mankind, he is the only party that's entering into the covenant. There is a benefit that is being given. There are two parties in that both parties receive a benefit, but he is the only one that has responsibility to keep those covenants. And as we saw, if you break a covenant, what is the result of breaking that covenant? It's death. If God doesn't keep his word, he's in essence saying, I'm putting my life on the line. If I don't give Israel, Abraham's family, this land, I will cease to exist, is what God says. If I flood the earth again at some point in the future, if I'm powerless to stop it for however, then he is putting his life on the line that he will then cease to exist because he's the only one that entered into those covenants. If there ever ceases to be someone on the throne of David, then he will cease to exist. Which seems kind of confusing because there's vast stretches of history where there's no one on a physical throne of David. But just as with the Levitical covenant, as Israel was going into exile, Jeremiah says, my covenant with the Levites still stands, even though there's no temple. When the temple was restored, that part of the covenant was then put back into action. If we'll see that again, when the temple is restored, the Levites, that God's covenant with them, will be put back into action, and they will be put in charge of protecting his holy space. And as we've looked through the covenants, we've seen a pattern begin to develop through each of these covenants. First off, there is a promise that's given. Uh, in Genesis 6, Noah is given the promise, I will make a covenant with you. Not now, later. Abraham, in Genesis 12, if you go to this land, I will bless the nations through you. Uh, Exodus 6, Exodus uh, 2 or 3, um, if you go to Egypt, and bring the people out. I will bring you to Mount Sinai and I'll bring you to my holy mountain and make you a nation. So God gives a promise prior to enacting the covenant. And often there's a call to action that accompanies the promise. Whether it's Noah, it's build an ark. If Noah doesn't obey and build an ark, Noah doesn't get the covenant in Genesis 9. If Abraham doesn't go to Canaan to stand in the land, he doesn't get the covenant in Genesis 15 of that land. And if Moses doesn't go back to Egypt 
to draw the people out of Egypt. Israel doesn't come to Sinai, and there's no Sinai covenant. There's a call to action when the promise is given before the covenant is enacted. We see that throughout. And that call to action is then followed by the obedience of an individual. Now, in many cases, especially in these three, we find that there is a moment of doubt at some point. We don't really encounter that in the story of Noah, um, but you have to imagine that as he's sitting there for seven days and nothing's happening and the door of the ark sealed, and he's like, what's going on here? That there was a moment of doubt. where he's like, are, are we just being stupid? It, it, like, I, I really swear I thought I heard God tell me to do this, but nothing's happening. But when we get to Abraham, we see it very clearly. In Genesis 15, as he's just come away from the war with Ketelam, or re- rescuing Lot, he encounters Melchizedek, he gives a tenth of his belongings to Melchizedek, and then as 15 begins, God says, I am your protector and your shield. And Abraham says, are you though? I don't have an heir. The heir of my house is Eliezer, this guy from this Damascus, who's the head of my servants. That's my heir. You promised me an heir from my from my body, but I don't have an heir. Is your promise really true? And God assures him, yes, my promise is true. Go count the stars in heaven. I will make your offspring from your body as numerous as the stars of heaven. And Abraham believed before the covenant was cut, before the covenant was sure, Abraham believed and that was counted to him as righteousness. The same with Moses. Moses went into Egypt. He went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, I don't know your God. And I'm not going to let your people go. In fact, I'm going to make it harder on them. And Moses goes back to God complaining, God, what are you doing here? You told me to come here. You told me to say this message to Pharaoh. You told me you would make sure that you're set free. What's happening? And God reassures him. At the end of chapter 5, we find his doubt. At the beginning of chapter 6 in Exodus, we find God re, uh, recounting the covenant that he had made with Abraham. I will bring you out. Watch. Just watch and wait and see what I am about to do. You will be set free. And it's only after all of this, then, that a covenant is made. The covenant is enacted. God walks through the pieces of the animal, the blood is shed, the sacrifice is made, whatever it is to enact the covenant, and the covenant is sealed. Now what's interesting is in, uh, especially in the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant is made in Genesis 15, but it doesn't come to fruition until uh, the end of the book of Exodus, or the middle of the book of Exodus. In fact, it's, it's actually the book of Joshua when Abraham's covenant is actually fulfilled. The fulfillment starts with Israel coming out of Egypt, and 40 years later, it ends with Israel actually walking into the land and claiming it. That's the covenant God made. There's a 400-year section where the people of Israel were in the Abrahamic covenant, but they did not experience the promise of the Abrahamic covenant. And in specifically the Sinai covenant, it is the only one that we've read up to this point that is conditional. If you obey my voice and keep my statutes, then I will make you a holy nation. And Israel failed almost immediately. And when they failed, what is the result of broken covenant? Death. What is the result that God threatened on Israel when they broke the covenant? I'm going to wipe you out and I'll make you a new nation, Moses. I'll fulfill my promise through you. A legitimate threat. Because God had every right to wipe Israel out. However, God also has built into the covenants a way to restore that covenant. When you break the covenant, when you incur the death penalty upon yourself, there is a way to restore your covenant with him. And that's through repentance. And we see Moses doing that as he um, goes before God and says, God, these people have sinned greatly. Take my life in exchange for theirs. He is repenting for their sins, and he is seeking to be a mediator between God and man, to take that penalty upon himself. But Moses, as just a man, is incapable of taking that penalty. So as we move forward now into the next series of covenants, um, we're going to see some of the pattern shift and change a little bit. It doesn't continue to follow this pattern of covenant. 
there are some things that are left out or that we're just not told about that we can kind of infer, but we're not specifically told. And so when we get to the Davidic covenant, the covenant with David, we find that a promise was given. Now, we're never explicitly told when the covenant was cut. We assume it's in First Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7, when God comes to, to David and says, I will build your house and build plant it forever. But the word covenant is never used in that chapter. We're only told about it later when David says, God covenant covenant with me at the end of 2 Samuel. And in the Psalms, when he says that the, it's repeated over and over, there is a covenant with David. And in Jeremiah, when the covenant that God made with David is as sure as the day and the night, the covenant that God has with day and night. But we do find the promise of the Davidic kingdom is hinted at. And it's hinted at while there is already a king in Israel. Saul is king at this time in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Verses 12 through 13. So Samuel goes to Jesse's family, calls all the sons. None of the sons, none of the seven that come before him are the one that are supposed to be the king. Finally, they call David in because he was left out in the fields to watch the flocks while all the others were being brought forward to be made king. And when he's brought in, Samuel sees him. And he sent and he brought him in and now, and now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. David was given the promise of being the king in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Was he king at that point? No. Was there a covenant of kingship at that point? No. Now, we're not given a specific call to action in the David story. However, if you move forward just a few chapters, you read the story of David and Goliath, where David goes as the only man to stand against the giants to defeat him. And it's possible that that is supposed to be the call to action where God didn't have to call David because he was so full of the Spirit that David just naturally acted in the way that God wanted him to act. And so there was no need to say, go fight this giant. David just gets there and says, he's... He's taking the name of my God in vain and making him look weak. How dare he? I will defend my God. However, we do read of David's doubt. All throughout 1 Samuel, near the end of the chapter, as David is being driven into exile and Saul is trying to kill him and he's running from place to place to place to place. We don't read of his doubt specifically in those stories, but in the Psalms that were written during that time of David's life, we read a ton of doubt. Oh my God, where are you? Why have you forsaken me? You've left me here to be overcome and overwhelmed by, by my enemies. David was eaten with doubt while he was in the wilderness on the run from Saul. He had to do things he never thought he would do. Go live with the Philistines. Pretend to be a madman. In fact, it said that David drew to him all the people that were disgruntled with Saul's kingdom. He was the king of the disgruntled for that time, time, in opposition to the legitimate king of Israel. But David did have doubts before the covenant was made. The promise had been made. He had been anointed. He had not yet come into that promise. And in that meantime, while things are looking like this isn't going to work out, David doubted. But David continued to remain faithful. He didn't take actions into his own hand. He allowed God to work out history in the way that God wished to work out history. And in the end, David was brought to the throne, and God gave David a covenant in 2 Samuel 7. Now, as I said, the word covenant is never actually said in this chapter, but we do get this promise. And when we read later of the Davidic covenant, it's this promise that is being referred to. And we can find that in texts that come after this. So in 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 16, it says, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up for your offspring after you who shall come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. 
When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him. As I took as I took it from Saul, who I put away from before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. That's the covenant that God made with David. Your throne, your family will rule my people forever. Well, some time went on. David has his covenant now. He's living in peace. He has brought peace to the realm around him, kind of. And yet David broke the covenant. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, we read of David committing adultery, betrayal, murder, and several other really terrible things. He was to be king. He was to be the man after God's own heart. And yet this covenant that God had cut with him, that your offspring will be forever, David transgressed it. Not just that, he's also transgressing the Mosaic Covenant. Primarily the Mosaic Covenant. The one that is conditional. And that resulted in death. In this case, because of David's repentance, it wasn't David's death. And because of the covenant God had made with David, that your family will rule this kingdom. But it was the death of his son. 2 Samuel 12, 14-15 Nevertheless, because this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, and the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house, and the Lord afflicted the child of Uriah's wife, bore to David, and he became sick. In this moment, it's actually just before this moment, that Nathan came to David and called him out on it by giving him a parable. The parable of the sheep, and the, the man who owned one sheep, and the man who owned hundreds of sheep, and the, so on and so forth. And when David finally recognized what Nathan was getting at, he was so very sorry. And we do read of his repentance. In 2 Samuel 12, verse 13, David acknowledges what he has done. But then when we get to Psalm 51, we find that he is just torn apart by what he's done at the full realization of what he has done. This is the repentance that God wants, not bulls and goats. Those do not make you right with God. He needs that repentance. He needs that heart that's broken for having transgressed his covenant. Well, as we go forward in the Bible, we find that the covenant that God made with David, it continues. We kind of saw it yesterday, Jeremiah 33, 17 through 22. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Oh, wait a minute. This was written as Israel is being taken into captivity and their kingdom is being destroyed. And yet God is saying there will never lack to be a man to sit on the throne. How do we reconcile those two things? And the Levitical priests shall never lack a man in my presence and offer burnt offerings and burnt grain offerings and to make sacrifices forever. But wait a minute, the temple is being destroyed. How is it that there will always be Levitical priests before God? The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, thus says the Lord, If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that day and night will not come at their appointed time, then also my covenant with David, my servant, may be broken, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne. And my covenant with the Levitical priests, my ministers, and the hosts of heaven cannot be numbered, and the sands of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the offspring of David, my servant, and the Levitical priests who minister to me. What God's saying here is that not he's not saying there will always be a temple for people to serve in, and there will always be a throne for people to sit on. He's saying there will never lack to be a person to take up that throne when the throne becomes available. And there will never be a person who the Levites will never be done away so that when the time and the situation is right, there will be Levites present to serve in my presence. Well, the Davidic covenant served for a long time, and yet there were other promises that were given. Promises of a new covenant. A covenant that is to be unlike any covenant that has come before it. 
Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on that day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor to say, and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and will remember their sins no more. This is the promise of a covenant to come. And as we've seen in the, in the pattern of covenant, the promise precedes everything. You get a promise of there will be a covenant. There will be something that I will do for you. Well, in Jeremiah 33, we are reading that I will do this for you. And in Jeremiah 31, we actually read of the foundation of this covenant. Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and fix the order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the seas so that its waves roar. This is the Lord of hosts, his name. So it's being founded on creation. I am the one who created day and night, the covenants I created with them. He's packing that into this passage. Because of day and night and the covenant and creation that is, that is here, this is the foundation for this new covenant. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundation of the earth below can be explored, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. The reason the new covenant can even hope to become into being is because God had a covenant with Israel that he would not cut them off despite their failures, despite their breaking the covenant, despite the full knowledge that each and every single one of them deserved death. Despite that, God would ensure his people continued so that the conditions for the new covenant could be in place when the time for the new covenant came. And that's all based on the existence of time itself. As long as time flows, Israel will exist. God's people will exist. His covenant stands. Now the new covenant, we often think to it, well, the new covenant is one that doesn't require any action, right? It's faith. Faith alone. Faith and works. Those are contrasted throughout the Bible. However, when we look to the New Testament and we look what occurred before the blood was spilt for the new covenant, we find there is a call to action being proclaimed. Matthew 3, 1 through 2. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. You've broken the covenant. Repent. Enter back into the covenant. That's the call to action. We see it echoed again. Mark 1, 4. John appeared baptizing the wilderness and proclaiming the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And we even see Yeshua teaching this in Mark 1, 15. And Yeshua saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. This is the call to action that is being placed on the people of God before the covenant is even enacted. This is the thing that people need to do before they can enter into the covenant. Now, is that works on their part in order to be saved? No. Not at all. God did everything to set those conditions. The repenting and the believing is just our role in accepting all that he has done. For example, I give you a gift, I wrap a gift, I place it before you. Here you go. Here's the gift. Do you have a gift? Yeah. Now you do. You <laughs> took an action and you reached out and you grabbed it. That's what repenting is. 
It's the reaching out and grabbing the gift that God has crafted, his mighty and wonderful gift of salvation. This new creation that he's invited you to become. The way we reach out, the way that we grasp that gift and draw it close is through repentance and through faith. And by the end of the Gospels, we read of a new covenant being cut. Luke 22, 20. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The new covenant that Jeremiah promised. As Yeshua is instituting the practice we call communion, he is saying, this cup, this blood that's about to be spilled out for you, this is the blood of that new covenant. This is the sacrifice that's necessary for this new covenant to even be possible. And in Hebrews 12, 22 to 24, we read, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to immeasurable angels, in, sorry, innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The new covenant is something that we are in now. You have come to Mount Zion. You have come before God with festal gatherings. That's all past tense. Because we have this mediator of the covenant, and his blood of the new covenant is the best blood there is for creating a covenant. However, like Abraham, who watched the smoking oven and the flaming torch walk between the pieces, like Abraham, who was in the covenant in Genesis 15, and yet in his lifetime he never experienced the fullness of that covenant. We too are in that now, not yet time period. We're in the new covenant. The promise is sure. It is to come, and we will be part of it. But the fulfillment of that covenant, the promises that were made in that covenant, have not yet come to pass. We're still waiting on that time. And Abraham is a perfect example of that. The promise was given in Genesis 12. The covenant was made in Genesis 15. But it was not fulfilled until the book of Exodus and the book of Joshua. Over 400 years between the entry into the covenant and the fulfillment of the covenant. Well, with Yeshua's blood being a better sacrifice for a better covenant, the time frame is many times greater, apparently. 2,000 years and counting at this point. And we're waiting still for that new covenant to come about. And many begin to doubt. Many begin to say, will it ever happen? Is this, uh, can we really be sure that this will happen? And the answer is yes, we can. Because we know these covenants that God has made in the past, he was sure to bring them about. He made a promise of a new covenant, and then he cut the new covenant. And he's invited us into that new covenant. And just like Abraham, did he live in the covenant of God? Yes. Do we live in the covenant of God? Yes. Did Abraham live to experience the fullness of that covenant? No. Is it likely that we will live to experience the fullness of God's covenant? Not in this lifetime. And so what does that Abrahamic covenant teach us about the new covenant? Just like Abraham... As he's standing there going, I don't see how this can possibly happen. It's been too long. I'm too old. I can't have kids. My wife can't have kids. Maybe, maybe we can make the new covenant come about under our own power. Maybe we could form a nation and you have kings and governors and laws. Maybe we could do that, right? All we got to do is just take Hagar 
have a child with Hagar, and we could have the fulfillment of the covenant, a child from Abraham's own body. Maybe we could do that, right? Let's form a nation, and let's conquer the world. Let's bring the new covenant to, to fruition in this world. That's what God wants. Or we can wait on his timing. We can wait for him to accomplish the miracle that looks impossible. Because as we get closer and closer to the end, it's going to look more and more and more impossible for that new covenant promise to be fulfilled. The fact is, is you are in Yeshua, you are in the new covenant. However, being in the new covenant does not mean all stipulations are met now. For those who don't understand that exclamation point equals its programming for does not equal. So, being in the new covenant doesn't mean you're going to experience all of the benefits of the new covenant in this instant. We need to be patient. But we also can look at what are the promises of the new covenant, the things that we can hope for. And we saw those in Jeremiah 33, verses 33 through 34. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. No longer should each one teach their neighbor and his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. That's the promise of the new covenant. Question. Where's new creation in there? Is it? Is the age to come part of this covenant that's being promised in Jeremiah? Or, as I talked about in the first lesson, is there yet a covenant to come? A covenant of which we have promises. We have many, many promises in Scripture. Isaiah 65, 17 through 25, tells us of the promises that we have. War will cease. Lion or wolf will lay down with lamb. There will be no death. There will be no uh, stillbirths. Life will be easier. We will live in God's kingdom. The days of a man will be like the days of a tree. Revelation 20 through 22 tells us of some of the promises that God has made in new creation. Some of those promises include a new heavens and a new earth. Jerusalem descending out of the heavens and coming to the earth. God dwelling with man again in our presence. Heaven and earth combined together. Again, no death, no sickness, no disease, no sorrow, no grief. In fact, in Revelation it says there's no night. There's no sea. And there's this beautiful city, and the tree of life is in the midst of it. And those who are in the city will have the right to eat from the tree of life. <clears throat> Meaning, eternal life. But my favorite place to go to for kingdom promises is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now if we go to 1 Corinthians 15, it opens with, this is the gospel that I gave to you. And Paul then lists out a few things that the gospel is definitely includes. He died, he was buried, he was raised on the third day, he was seen by many witnesses. And when you talk to most Christians, that's where they're going to stop their gospel messages at that place. Because Paul does take it aside. As Paul does, he goes to talk about another subject, tangentially, before he returns back to his primary topic. But when he gets back to his primary topic, he is still talking about what is this gospel that was taught to me that I am passing on to you. And what does that gospel include? 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 28. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man also has come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. 
Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. When he comes, the end. When he delivers the kingdom of God, kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is expected to put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him. That God may be all in all. This is a promise that we are given in 1 Corinthians of the future when Christ will come and defeat every enemy of mankind. The adversary character that's against us from the beginning will be wiped from the story to be seen no more. And the only characters left will be God and man. <coughs> Conflict will be overturned. The death punishment that has been placed upon man, that curse, will be reversed and lifted. Question is, is this the promise of a new covenant? Something else that is yet to come upon Christ's return? When I read of the new covenant in Jeremiah and the terms that it has, it doesn't necessarily contain everything that is being promised here. Is it possible we're in this moment of promise where there is a call to action before a covenant is cut? Are we in that Abrahamic covenant of the new covenant where Abraham's covenant has not yet come to fruition? And before it can even come to full fruition in taking the land, another covenant comes in and is added to it, the Sinai covenant. Are we in that sort of place? The covenant of Yeshua, we're in it. It hasn't yet been, been fully fulfilled. But just as then, before Abraham's covenant could be fully fulfilled, that new covenant is brought in of Sinai and added to it. So that when Israel comes into the land, there's more going on than just the covenant with Abraham. There's now the covenant with Israel, the people. The fact is, we don't know. We're not told of another covenant to come. But if we follow the pattern, there is that potential. That before we get to that new age, God will create one, another covenant with mankind that contains all of the promises. And it will come in our darkest hour. When the doubt is the deepest. When we say there's no way the new covenant can possibly come. Are you sure you've made that, that we're in it? Are you sure we're going to make it there? That mankind can be restored? That this world that's falling apart can be made anew? And if we follow the pattern, it's in that time of deepest, darkest doubt that God then cuts a covenant with his people and says, yes. Yes, it is true. And it is so true, I'm putting my existence on the line to ensure its truth. I think that we catch sight of a promise being given of this other covenant in the prophets. Let me show you what, I, what I'm talking about. Hosea 2, 18 through 20. And I will make with them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow and the sword and war from the land. And I will make you lie down in safety. And I will betroth you to me forever. And I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and in steadfast love and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. Does the covenant that's being spoken of here in Hosea sound like the new covenant in Jeremiah? No. They sound like two completely different covenants. One is, you will know me, and I will be with you, 
and I will teach you my laws. I will put them within you. The other one is, I will make war to cease from the earth. And when Yeshua came, he says, I did not come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. I think Hosea is telling us of another covenant that is yet to come. A covenant of peace on earth. A covenant of the cessation of all wars. And this covenant, just like the covenant with creation, just like the covenant with Noah, isn't just made with man. It's made with the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, and the creeping things of the ground as well. It's a covenant that is going to be made with all of creation. Not just with mankind as the Sinai covenant, as the new covenant. This is a restoration covenant. The thing that was broken in the beginning, a covenant is coming, it seems to say in Hosea, that will, that is the promise of the overturning of the curse. Well, as we've been going through the festival cycle, there's been a certain word that's been used to describe the process of getting to the garden. And as we go through the festivals, we find that the majority of the festivals celebrate this particular idea. And it's the idea of harvest. Whether it be Passover at the barley harvest, whether it be Shavuot at the um, wheat harvest and the, the other springtime crops, or Sukkot at the fall harvest. Harvest is a part of the cycle of restoration. And throughout the Bible, we read of this idea of harvest, especially in the New Testament, being applied to a later day. Matthew 13, 24 through 30. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among them and among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain... Then the weeds appeared also. And the servant of the master of the house came in and into him and said, Master, did you sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers to gather the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And there's multiple times throughout the Gospels and throughout the epistles that we read of this harvest. And it is a harvest of the end. Matthew 13, 36 through through 43. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. What does that parable you just said, what does it mean? And he answered and he said, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weed is the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The son of man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let them hear. This is a promise from Yeshua of being brought into a future kingdom and shining like the sun with the father. That sounds like a promise from this other covenant that's hinted at, but has never, has not yet been, not yet occurred. And this harvest, we actually read of this harvest in Revelation 14, 13 through 16. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like the Son of Man, with a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat in the cloud, Put in your sickle to reap, 
for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the clouds swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. In that parable, Yeshua specifically said it's the angels who will do the harvesting. And in Revelation we read it's the angels who are doing the harvesting. Now there is a harvest to be had. But that harvest isn't ours to reap. And yet, there is a call to action that's part of this covenant that we are to fulfill before we get to the covenant. And that is to be laborers in the harvest. Luke 10, 2, and he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. The angels are the ones who are going to do the reaping, but there are laborers among mankind who need to go out and participate in this harvest. John 4, 38, 34 through 38. And Yeshua said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me to accomplish his work. Do not say, There are yet a few months, yet then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest in the time of Yeshua. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. And here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I send you to reap that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. We as believers are being called into this harvest of this covenant. This is the call to action of the covenant of new creation. Not to go out and build a kingdom with kings and rules and laws and roads and taxes, but to bring people into the kingdom of heaven, to harvest for the king, to spread the boundaries of his kingdom into the world. And as we end Sukkot, as we come to the end of our time together, this call to action should resonate in all of our ears. Because we don't reach the day that is the harvest day, that is the new creation, the time we're celebrating now, without first going through the harvest. And Yeshua has called each and every one of us to go, to sow, and to reap. That's the charge we have been given in this world. Yes, we will get there one day. We will experience that day that is all Sabbath, that is all rest and all repose and all life. But we are not there yet. Right now, we have a charge. Our charge is to go out into this world of darkness. And Yeshua came to them and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, so go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the call to action that Yeshua has given us of the covenant that it seems Hosea is speaking of but has not yet been given to mankind. This is the call to action that Abraham received to go to the land that God would show him. This is the call to action that Moses received to go into Egypt and to pull his people out. It's the same call to action. It's just part of another covenant. And now it's our job, our role, to go out as laborers into the harvest. To work. Yes, to suffer. To potentially be killed. But we can do this knowing that the promise is sure. The covenant is sure. Even if it hasn't been officially cut, the promise has been given. It will be cut. And it will come to pass. New creation is coming. We read of it throughout Scripture. 
the curse of the beginning will be reversed. But God wants us to not isolate ourselves and say, well, I'm going to get there. I sure hope all y'all make it. But I'm going. He wants us instead to say, no, come with me. You can come too. And you can come. And you can come. And you can come. Because he wants all nations represented. He doesn't want an intimate few who just happen to make it. He wants every nation, tongue, and tribe to be part of that kingdom. Every person group on earth to be represented in his new kingdom. And this is the charge that I'm going to leave you with. Let's go into this world. The time is short. The harvest is plentiful. Let's add our labors to the labors of those already harvesting. Let's reach out to those who are lost, to those who are enemies of God, and extend them the grace that God has given us so soon. That same gift that he has given us. Let's tell them about it, that they too can reach out and grasp that gift and bring it close. All it takes is repentance. That's it. Humble yourself before God. Recognize you've broken his covenant and his law. That's it. That's one of the hardest things a person can do. But that's it. And it takes the Holy Spirit to help a person to do this. But that's it. Repent. And you can be saved. As we wait the next six months to start the cycle again, as we continue then once more contemplate all of these covenants, the path of history, what it means for us, what it means for the world around us. This is the charge that should be ringing in our ears as we come away from celebrating the kingdom to come. Is the people we celebrated with were amazing. But I'll tell you, every year as it gets bigger and bigger, it's more and more amazing. Having 50 people here is way better than six. That's right. <laughs> it's better than 15. It's better than 30. And God's saying the same thing. Grow the numbers. Bring them in. So let's do that. Let's grow the numbers of the kingdom. Let's work in the harvest. And by next year it's at Sukkot, we may get a tangible taste of how God is working through us in the world around us. So let's go into the world. Let's add to that church. Not necessarily to God together. Let's add to God's church. His body. His people. Wherever you're at. Wherever they can connect to. Wherever they can fit into his kingdom. Because not everybody belongs here. God has places for other people in other bodies. But let's always be working to grow. Let's always be working towards repentance.